So as we've seen, there have been uh, quite a number of issues with the United States in terms of crime and punishment. Uh, we see the United States uh, issues of policing and police interactions with the public as a whole. And many of these same phenomena occur not only in the United States, but in many different countries as well. Um, in the remainder of the lecture, I will provide some examples from anthropologists' work in various cultural contexts as they explore the interactions between police and uh, citizens as well as various stakeholders, um, including Chinese wholesalers. And Tremont's work in 2013, Publicizing Insecurity, Privatizing Security, looks at Chinese wholesaler surveillance cameras in a uh, Paris suburb. Specifically, um, she examines state or police interactions with citizens in terms of the control of crime and the uh, under-policing that's occurring in terms of meeting the needs of Chinese wholesalers. In this region of France, uh, a suburb of Paris, uh, you have uh, you have 700 estimated Chinese uh, wholesalers who have called for strengthening of the police force in order to protect them from violent robberies. These robberies take place not only at the stores, uh, after hours, during hours, but also individuals uh, will be followed home, owners will be followed home, and they will be robbed outside of their home or sometimes even in their home. And so the police are well aware of the situation in terms of the targeting of uh, Chinese wholesalers in uh, the suburb of France, uh, of Paris. In 2011, the uh, Chinese wholesalers formed the UCAS, or the Chinese Merchant League for Public Safety. And they have been involved with the police in a variety of settings, and Tremont does much of the work uh, with uh, the anthropological work that's done is done in unison with, in meetings with the police as well as these Chinese merchants. And in the meetings, the police encourage the Chinese merchants to change their image overall. And the image essentially is that uh, Asians have lots of money and they always have lots of money. I'm not exactly sure how they are to change that image in the context of broader public perspective. Nonetheless, this was one of the references that uh, was made uh, in Tremont's piece by the police. And uh, the second one would be to report crime to the police. And historically and for cultural reasons as well, uh, there is an underreporting of crime um, by these Chinese wholesalers in particular. And some of this has to do uh, with conceptualizations of, of crime and how it's dealt with in China. And of course, these ideas get carried over into uh, France uh, with the uh, migrants uh, into France, first or second generation. And the other thing is a physical barrier to reporting. Reporting becomes really difficult. They have to go to the downtown police station, uh, and this has been because of the closing of a local police station in the neighborhood, uh, which provides even more of a barrier. So not only is there a, a cultural barrier to going and reporting on crimes that have been committed against them, but also a physical or proximity bar barrier as well. Uh, Sherman continues on and talks about policing as a function of the state, but in fact these, this is a, a, an area of the state where we see cutbacks, uh, essentially diminishing resources, a lack of funding that's being provided overall. And in one of these meetings, um, there's a one merchant, an, an older merchant, who offers to buy the police scooters. And the reasoning is, is that many of the criminals, uh, when they come and they steal things, they will escape on scooters. And the police don't necessarily have these things and are not e these criminals are not easy to apprehend. And so a scooter would make it easier to, for the police to apprehend the criminals. The uh, police were taken aback by this. Uh, they had phrased it in terms of a, an official discussion, in terms of needing a public-private arrangement to be set up and that this arrangement would be a quite lengthy process in order to set up and it wouldn't be something that it couldn't just be a gift of a, of a scooter. Uh, and the gift altered the social relation in that particular setting as it demonstrated the inability of the police to give Chinese wholesalers what it is they wanted, and namely that was the means to prevent crime. Um, and so with the cutbacks that have occurred, the police have readily acknowledged that the Chinese wholesalers have been targeted uh, for criminal activity, for mostly for theft, uh, but at the same time are hesitant to give up 
uh, or uh, give up any of the uh, policing functions to individuals uh, or to accept assistance in uh, uh, from private individuals for uh, police efforts as a whole. And so cameras are presented as a solution. And with cameras, we see this notion, uh, of this idea of surveillance overall, the idea of watching people or the perception that they're being watched sometimes is enough to deter criminals. Unfortunately for both the Chinese wholesalers as well as the police, the uh, cameras in public spaces have been illegal under um, the French Constitution. And the mayor of the city essentially was counting on the passing of an article uh, Article 18 in Lopsi uh, in 2011 that would allow for the filming of public spaces uh, from private buildings. And uh, during this time period, a number of cameras were being set up by these Chinese merchant associations, uh, by the Chinese Merchant Association, individual um, shop owners. And so it was just assumed that they would be, once the law would pass, it would become legal um, and there wouldn't be any sort of contentious issue. However, Article 18 of LOPSI was deemed unconstitutional as it would entrust public surveillance to private persons. And uh, so they're in a situation right now where the Chinese wholesalers still have these cameras on their buildings that are pointing to public spaces. This has been deemed to be unconstitutional. Um, nevertheless, the police are not enforcing the law. Uh, they're not enforcing the law. Uh, in terms of requiring that the Chinese wholesalers remove the cameras. Rather, they um, actually have um, congratulated the host wholesalers on their purchases of these cameras and this idea of safety and surveillance overall because in, in order to fight the higher crime rates. Uh, it was assumed to a, that to a certain extent the Chinese wholesalers would share the information with the police. This has not really come about. Um, rather, the wholesalers have utilized the cameras in order to catch uh, individuals, in order to find out who might be violating the law or stealing something, and then chase them down themselves to try to re uh, regain the property. So this is used for immediate self-enforcement of security. And so this is a, a, a what Gregory Bateson refers to as a double bind here. You have the recognition of both parties that the other is transgressing, but the inability to do uh, anything about that. Uh, we see in Livingstone's uh, 2014 piece, Armed Peace, Militarization of Rio de Janeiro's Favelas and for the World Cup, we see here the issue of the, the state uh, and, and its role in policing and preparing cities for international events. Uh, and we see uh, the notion here that there's potentially over policing that's occurring in this region and particularly over policing of certain uh, communities which have become deemed to be a, a problem or an impediment to a national event which demonstrates uh, the state as a whole and putting its boat its face its best foot forward uh, for both uh, public in a in, at the level of Brazil as a whole, and then the larger international public, too. Um, these international events require tremendous amounts of resources. They often involve restructuring cities around the events, and events, many of these larger um, sporting events, actually put a, a fair amount of economic burden on a, a particular region. Livingstone points out that this burden is not equally shared and it's not only in terms of economic an economic burden but also an issue of justice as a whole. And so what's happened in this case with the favelas uh, in Rio de Janeiro is that uh, you have police forces which are coming in and attempting to pacify uh, many of these favelas under increasingly oppressive control. Uh, and th this is sometimes what's known as proximity policing. And the individuals that are targeted are mainly poor young black men. Uh, and these individuals have often been killed in the name of uh, and by the police under, under this pacification policy and under the name of really maintaining order within society. The uh, 
there has been an attempt by the state to reconfigure the city to prepare it for the 2014 World Cup and the 2016 uh, Olympics. And this has involved a number of things which have been incredibly detrimental to local community, including military occupations, evictions, and gentrification of neighborhoods overall. The increase in policing or the pacifying policing units or proximity policing uh, was supposed to be paired with social investments. These never materialized uh, and many social activists make the claim that these are really needed to build the foundations for lasting peace uh, in the favelas, um, social development projects as a whole. Uh, the UPP presence is seen as a pathway to full citizenship as well as protection of civil rights. It essentially opens up the favela um, to these to these notions of democracy, essentially, to this idea of protection of human rights, and indeed to realizing the full potential of citizenship uh, through the police in order to maintain order within society, and, and indeed to bring order to the favelas. Uh, but what Tremont, or what Livingstone points out, is that what has actually happened is that the presence of the UPP has opened up the favela as a market, as a place for market, and right behind the UPP have come the telecommunications and electric companies. And so this is seen as a means towards uh, privatization. Uh, and so we see the, te the, uh, the existence not only here with Livingstone of uh, the parallel between uh, policing and development, but also in the context of Truman's piece, where we see this in, in France as well. Uh, so there have been numerous reports uh, that have come out uh, about the impacts of UPP. Uh, one of the most popular newspapers in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, has highlighted the positive impacts uh, that have come from studies, including a decrease in the number of homicides, uh, in criminal activity with the presence of police, uh, and an increase in overall freedom of movement for individuals. However, other reports, often not cited in mainstream media, Note the negatives from studies, uh, these negatives uh, that have occurred, uh, and these have been documented in these studies, including an increase in homicides of black males that are three times more likely to be killed than their white counterparts, high levels of victims that have been shot by the police in an apparent confrontation. These apparent confrontations are rarely investigated, um, and there were 416 in 2013. There have also been a number of disappearances that have occurred or people essentially going missing for long periods of time. Some of this has actually been associated uh, with uh, policing activity, according to Livingstone. Uh, others in Livingstone talk um, and discuss how the police actually impair their movements uh, with frequent stops and searches so that individuals are assumed uh, because they're young black males to be uh, criminal elements. And so they're continuously stopped and searched. Uh, and so this really impedes their ability to move across space. It really imp impairs their ability and their freedom of movement overall. Uh, one of the things that's gone along with this has been resistance to the UPP and some of the uh, disastrous impacts in terms of uh, decrease in, uh, in relatively affordable housing with a destruction of homes, for example, and the gentrification process. The uh, media, as well as police, according to Livingstone, have portrayed many of the social movements as being aligned with drug traffickers and aligned in the sense that they're portrayed as either financed or coerced by the drug traffickers. And so following Ag Agamemnon uh, in 2003, Rio de Janeiro, according to Livingstone, becomes a city of exception, a city where uh, the law... Um, is not equally distributed or a particular types of policing and enforcement that would be required in the favela would be and indeed necessary for development would not be generally accepted in other neighborhoods as a whole and amongst this uh, the protesters of uh, the development processes surrounding the World Cup and the Olympics uh, have been the social movements and here you can see a sign at the top here that essentially reads, the party in the stadium isn't worth the tears in the favela.